Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We welcome our visitors. We're glad to see you here at Northside. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And you in the radio listen audience, if you'll get on your phone, call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour, I do believe we'll be an inspiration to them. Dr. Jerry Montgomery will be with us tomorrow night. He's from Bristol, Tennessee, pastor the Gateway Baptist Church there in Bristol, a man mightily used of God. I want you to come every night if you can, Monday night through Friday night, get in on the meeting tell your friends about it now the north side baptist church is an old-fashioned fundamental bible believing independent missionary baptist church where everybody is somebody no big eyes and little use every man puts his feet on the floor just alike here at north side you can enter without knocking now i hope you can leave the same way so we're looking forward to seeing you in the meeting. I want you to write in and get some of our cassette tape. Now the tape today will be tape number 243 and I'm speaking on the subject what is better than going to heaven. You may say preach Edwards you mean to tell me there's something better than going to heaven? Yes I'll tell you what it is in the message. You may turn to 1st Corinthians chapter 3. Now I have about 242 other tape listed, 242 tape listed. You can write in and get these by number or by title. I'd like for you to write in and get the tape that you'd like to have. Write in and get a list of our cassette tape. Now these tape are $3 each, and then the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. We have other expense connected with our radio ministry, that's not involved in just paying the radio station. And so I hope that you'll write to me. And then I have in my hand here a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour for March of next year. We plan to spend eight days in Israel, two days in Geneva, Switzerland. We're going to fly the Swiss airlines, the most safe airlines, I think, today. There's no land that is safer than the nation of Israel. As I said before, there's been uh, some five people killed in the Middle East since the first of the year. There have been 464 killed in the city of New York. So you're far safer traveling in Israel than you are traveling down the streets of New York City or some other uh, great city in America. God's going to keep you on the earth. He gets ready for you to go, so you won't have to worry about that. The Lord will take care of us. Write in and get a brochure. Just write in for your tape, write in for the brochure. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. I'd like to hear from you uh, this week, and we appreciate it so very much. I hope you've turned in your Bible now to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 for the reading of God's Word. I was reading the other day about these two men going to take a motorcycle ride. And uh, one man thought it was a little chilly. He'd just go ahead and put his coat on backwards. So he turned his coat around and put it on backwards and crawled on the seat behind the drive on the motorcycle. They went down the highway and they had a wreck. And whenever the trooper moved on the scene, he noticed the accident. And then when he was reporting the accident, they say, he said he told the people this. He said, when I arrived on the scene... He said the man that was driving the motorcycle was dead and said by the time I got the other man's head turned around like it was supposed to be, well, he stopped breathing. So you see then uh, sometimes you make a mistake by turning your coat around. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning with verse, um, let's begin with verse 6, page 1214 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 
Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now notice that. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we labor together with God, you are God's husbandry, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work should be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which is built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. That's reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. Speaking on the subject, what is better than going to heaven? Let me give you the answer. What's better than going to heaven is be rewarded and get the approval of Jesus when you get there. That's far better than just merely going to heaven. Some people said, well, if I can just make it in, I'll be happy. Well, I suppose you would, but I'll tell you something better than making it in. Being able to receive a reward and be able to hear Jesus say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what you need to be concerned about. If you're a born again believer, you'll make it in. You'll go to heaven, but you need to be concerned about what's going to happen after you get there when you appear to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, according to the Bible, some will receive no or even just a part reward. The Word of God tells us in our text, every, man shall be made, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Of what sort if you're not laboring for God, according to the Bible, you'll never be rewarded for it. God can only reward you of the sort the good kind, the kind that he tells about in the Bible, that is your labors for him. Now other works will be burned up. Everything you've done for your own glory, everything you've done to boost or encourage a cult, everything you've done contrary to the Bible and call it the work of God will be burned up, the Bible tells us. Now some can lose what they've already wrought. Now that's something you need to take in consideration. You've been laboring for God for a period of time, and you can lose what you've already wrought. Now you need to be careful about that. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Behold I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Do you want some other man to take your crown? Well you better hold fast. Walk straight. Do what God said in this book. And Second Corinthians. Or second or John rather. Second John verse 8. The Bible said, look to yourselves that you lose not those things which you have wrought, but you may receive a full reward. Now, if that verse of Scripture is telling you anything, it's telling you you can lose what you've already wrought. It's broken my heart many times. I've had people come here to Northside, members of this church, labor for God, be faithful in serving God, then leave here, go out into the world, backslide on God, and lose everything that they've ever accomplished for God. They'll lose every bit of it. Backslidden on God. Living like the devil. Tearing down what they build up. And you need to be careful. After you have built up a reward. That you don't turn around and tear it down. There's a possibility of you doing that. Said, so look to yourselves that you lose. Not those things which you've wrought. But that you receive a full reward. In the book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18. The Bible said, let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worship of angels, intruding after those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by fleshly mind. So the Bible said, let no man beguile you in regard to worshiping or, or honoring or looking to uh, other things of this world, place your affections on them, and then losing out what you've accomplished for God. Now there'll be some people that'll be ashamed at the beam our seat of Christ. 
The Bible tells us so, even at his second coming. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, Ab abide in him, that when he shall appear, you may have confidence and be not ashamed at his appearing or his coming. So there be some Christian people that will bow their heads in shame when they see Jesus. The reason is, is because they fail to serve God as they should have. Some receive the rewards in this life. If what you're doing today, you're doing it for your own glory. Or you're doing it to accomplish things for your own greedy wants in this world. Then you'll not receive a reward for that. In Matthew chapter 6 verses 2 through 4, the Bible said, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that the alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So what you do, do it to the glory of God, not to be seen or heard of men, that you may be glorified and bragged on about what you're doing. Be humble about what you do for God if God is blessing you. And the more God blesses you, the more humble you should be. Now you can receive a full reward. That should be the desire of every born again believer. In the book of Ruth chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible said, The Lord recompense thy works and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. So the Bible said there, there's a possibility of you receiving a full reward. That should be your desire. That should be my desire that we receive a full reward. Now let's find out some things that you're rewarded for. I'm talking today about what's better than going to heaven. Things that are better than going to heaven would be the rewards and the approval and the smile of Jesus after you get there. It's good to enter in. It's even good to be saved so as by fire. But you want to do better than that. You want Jesus to smile on you. You want Jesus to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You want to receive rewards at the Bemar seat of Christ. That should be your aim. What are you going to be rewarded for? First of all, the Bible tells us we'll be rewarded for good works. You'd be surprised at how many times this Bible speaks of good works. If you read in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you find in all the churches there in Asia Minor, the Lord said, I know thy works. I know thy works. There's not a thing you do for God, even if given a cold drink of water in the name of the disciple, but God won't keep a record of it. Some people murmur, complain, grumble, and growl, and you have to beg them and plead with them to do something for God. That's a shame. You ought to be proud and delighted over the fact of doing anything you can for God. After all said and done, when you come to die, what's going to really count in that hour? Money you got in the bank, stocks and bonds, lands, business, popularity, political standing. Is that going to count when you come to the end of life's journey? No, no, no. What's going to count when you come to the end of life's journey? What have I done for God? What have I done for God? Have I been used for God? What have I sacrificed for God? That's the only thing that's going to count. All the other things, you come to the end of them when you come to die. So that's good works. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 8. Now he that planteth, he that watereth the one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And you're rewarded for good works. Secondly, for things you have sacrificed and suffered for. You never suffer for God down here. You'll never mistreat it, slanted, lied on, talked about, or criticized, but what God doesn't know about it. And God keeps a record of that, and God will reward you for these things. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, the Bible said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say, All amount of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the Bible said you ought to praise God. You ought to rejoice when people criticize you and talk about you and, and they're present in your windows in, on your behalf in regard to you. You ought to praise God. 
Because the Bible said that's adding to your reward. You're looking at a Baptist preacher today that's been preaching daily from the classic city of Athens, Georgia through medium of radio uh, almost 38 years. On the last day of this month, if God permits me to preach on the radio through the last day of this month, I will have been preaching 38 years daily from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. That's not a man that's been cussed, that's been lied on, that's been slandered, that's been misjudged, that's been talked about, that's been criticized, that's been run down, than this preacher that you hear speaking right now. Not a man in Athens, Georgia. Because for 38 years I preached the gospel, busted people's hide, cut down the tree, let the chip fall where they may, and they have trimmed up people's hedges, beloved, and, and they just don't like it. They don't like the truth. They don't like the gospel. And then because I preach against people's sins and because of envy and jealous and malice and because people are jealous of what little effort this preacher's put forth, they criticize me, talk about me, lie on me, slander me, and listen to see if they can hear something on me that they might pass it on. They'll give an account unto God for any damage that might have been done because of that. But God will reward me at the judgment seat of Christ for every lie, every word of criticism, every slander, every window, everything that's been said against this Baptist preacher that God called to preach the gospel back in 1942. Everything that's been said against me, God will reward me for that. And God will take care of those that did any damage that might have been done. And the same thing can apply to you. Now, don't you run and hide when you're criticized, when people talk about you or run you down, allow on you or slander you. If you do that, you'll never get anywhere for God. Beloved, listen to me. If the postman, if the postman listened to every little fire that barked, every little dog that ran out and growled at him, you'd never get the mail put up. Had I listened to criticism and people's ideas and theories and wants and desires, I'd have left the ministry a long, long time ago. Beloved, I shut my ears to what people might think or say and determined to set my face like a flint. I, I made up my mind to do this more than 40 years ago. I'm still headed in the same direction. Let the little feist bark and, and let the little puppies come and whine and let the old bulldog growl, brother. I'm headed on down the road for God. There's a man driving down the street, and behind him, and he, he was riding on a wagon. Behind him was a big old ugly shepherd dog following that wagon. Every little feist and rat terror in the, in the little village there saw that old dog, and they came out, and they barked, and they snapped at him, and they growled. But that old dog never turned his head. He kept his eyes right on his master. His master was sitting on the seat of that wagon, Headed down the street, that dog never took his eyes off of him, followed him right on down Main Street. Now, when you get your eyes off of the master and you start barking back at this little uh, a rat tyrant and start barking over here at the little, little pick in the ease and start barking at these little feists and these little dogs that's barking at you, when you get your eyes off of that master, you love to get into a dog fight and it's not going to help you. You keep your eyes on the master, move straight down the road, and when you get to the end of the street, then you will come out victorious. You can't afford that every Tom, Dick, and Harry dictate to you or, or deviate you from what you know God wants you to do. Set your face like a flint. Keep moving on for God, and God rewards you. And so things that you sacrifice and suffer for, God rewards you for it when you come to the end of life's journey. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Why did he do that? Extreming the reports of Christ's greater riches and the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of reward. Moses said, I give it all up, all of my learning, my wealth, my standing in the land of Egypt. I'm stepping down and suffer with the people of God because I have the reward in mind. I'd rather suffer with God's people and have less 
than to run with the world of crowd and be blessed in this world and miss out at the judgment seat of Christ. And Moses stepped down with God's people and became their commander, their pastor, and their teacher as they sojourned. Then God's going to reward you for what you give up. For what you give up. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of the disciple, verily I say to you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, he said, Take heed. You do not charge before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, there will be no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And so God rewards you for what you give or give up or sacrifice toward his cause. Then he rewards you for faithful service rendered. What we need is faithfulness among God's people. A lady called me the other day. And she said, Preach Edwards. Said, uh, uh, y'all going to have a survival over there? Well, we may need a survival. And I think we need a revival. I said, sister, we're going to hope to have a revival. We could take on a survival, all right. We need to try to survive, but we need to be revived. And so we must be faithful in serving God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 17, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if it's against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. I want that to sink deep down into your ears. Seven times Jesus said in the gospel, let these things sink deep down in your ears. Seven times Jesus said to the seven churches of Asia Minor, he said, hear what we have, what I say unto the churches. God put two ears, one on each side of your head that you might hear something, that you might hear more in one tongue, that you might speak less. Now God wants you to hear some things and the Bible said here, if you do what you do willingly to the glory of God, you'll receive a reward. But if you do it against your will, you're not going to be rewarded for it. You must do what you do willingly to the glory of God in order to be rewarded. Don't do it because uh, the preacher forces you to do it. Don't do it because you think you just got to do it. Do it because you love God. Come to church because you love God. Give of your means because you love God. Spend time in fellowship and prayer because you love God. Not because you think you've got to do it. Do it because you love the Lord. And if you do it because you love God, there's a reward waiting for you at the end of life's journey. And then he's going to reward us for a good race run. We're on a racetrack. Whether you realize it or not, you're on a racetrack. We're running for God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, Know ye that they which run the race run all but one receive the prize. So run that you may obtain. Now many of you have been involved, some of you involved in sports, some of you like sports, some see it, some maybe dislike it. But anyway, if you notice in these track races, whenever these people run in these foot races, they set out to win that race. They put everything they have in it because they want to receive a prize at the end of the race. And the person that comes out ahead, that outruns others, he gets the greatest prize. God Almighty said you on a racetrack. When God saved you, he put you on a racetrack. Now you're on God's racetrack and you're running for the Lord. And if you keep on running and keep on running and keep on moving on for God, you'll come out victorious at the end and you'll get a reward. But you have a lot of church members, they're running on the racetrack, and they know there's people in the grandstand, and somebody yells out something they don't like, they stop to look and, and maybe to fuss back to see what the man said. And when you do that, you come out on the tail end of the line, brother. You can't pay any attention to what people think about you or say about you on the sideline or what their opinions might be. You must run your race that you might come out ahead at the end of life's journey. You can't let people stop you. You must keep on keeping on for God. A good race run, the Bible tells us. Then according to the Bible, there's going to be different kinds of crowns that we receive when we get to heaven. Would you like to get a crown? The Bible said you need to be careful, take heed, walk softly, walk straight, lest somebody take your crown away from you. Somebody may take your crown away from you. 
Some of you may have heard me tell this, but it's personal, and I hope you bear with me. It illustrates the point. Many years ago, I had an uncle, my dad's brother, that moved to the city of Greenville, South Carolina. And he and his wife got saved over there and joined the Westview Baptist Church. And people on fire for God. That was during the days of depression. They loved God. They talked about God. They prayed. There's prayer meetings going on everywhere. People couldn't hardly get enough food to survive on. And they got saved. And they came back to Georgia and paid us a visit. I thought that's the happiest people I've ever seen in my life. I wanted to be like them. I, I wanted to be saved like they were. I wanted to uh, be in the church where they went. As a little boy at the age of 12, I went down behind the bar and I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, I'd like to be saved. And Lord, I'd like to go to Greenville. And I'd like to go to the same church where my uncle and his wife go. They're so happy. Lord, I'd just like to be there and get in on that. I prayed that prayer as honest and as sincere as I knew how. And then time rolled on. At the age of about 19, you know where I landed? In the city of Greenville. At the age of 19, the age of 12 when I prayed the prayer. And I landed right near this church I'd prayed about. For two years, God reminded me, you remember? You remember? You remember what you prayed at the age of 12? That you want to come to Greenville? You want to come to this church? You want to be saved? You want to live like those people live? Two years that thing hounded me. And then God saw I wasn't going to stop. And God struck me down and put me flat on my back and said, I want you to hear me. You know what you prayed when you was 12 years old? I said, yes, Lord. My mother had her arms around my neck. The preacher had me by the hand. I was lying flat on my back. I said, he turned yes to God. And on 19 and 40, in October 19 and 40, I said, he turned yes to God. Beloved, listen to me. After I said, he turned yes to God, this uncle of mine, God called him to preach. But he backslid on God. And every time that he'd come back to God, he'd prosper and then backslide on God and lose everything he had. And he kept on doing that till God laid him on the ship. You know what God did? And when God had called him to preach, he, he had a dynamic personality. He could have been a wonderful soul winner. He could have done wonders for God had he went on with God. But you know what happened? God just gave up on him. And called me in his place. God gave up on him. And called me in his place. I preached his funeral. When he was 46 years old. He could have been living today. Had he served God. God killed him. Took him off the scene. Called me to preach his place. What are you saying preacher? The Bible said. Be careful. Lest somebody else. Take your crown. That man. Could have had a crown. And instead of going on for God. Like he should have. God laid him aside. God called me to preach. God cut him off. I preached his funeral. He's buried down here in the Whitworth Cemetery below Diamond Hill. God help us to realize somebody can take your crown and you can have a crown and God wants you to have a crown and you can. That's a martyr's crown. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. For none of these things which thou shalt suffer be thou faithful in death, I'll give thee a crown of life. Don't fear them. That's a martyr's crown. Every person that gives his life for the cause of God will get a martyr's crown. They're the only ones that get it. Secondly, there's a preacher's crown. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 24, rather, yes, that's right, 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, the Bible tells you there is a preacher's crown. If a man is called of God to preach and carry the gospel, if he'll be faithful and do what God wants him to do the best of his ability, as long as he's able to do so, when he gets to the end of life's journey, he'll receive a preacher's crown. Somebody said to me some time ago, Preacher, are you going to retire? I said, no, I'm going to refire. I want to move right on to the end of life's journey preaching the gospel. I might not be pastor of the church. I might not be in full-time evangelism. But brother, I'll preach the gospel that God closes my lips as long as I live by his grace. And we'll get a preacher's crown if we're faithful. Then there's a soul winner's crown. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1 tells you there's a soul winner's crown. If you be a faithful soul winner, you'll get a soul winner's crown at the BMRC. And then there's a faithful watcher's crown. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Are you watching for Jesus? Are you watching for the enemy? Are you watching for God's people? 
There's a faithful watcher's crown, and you can get that one. And then there's a victor's crown. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, you'll find the victor's crown. Those are victorious, those who overcome the world, overcome the devil by the blood of Christ, and keep overcoming. There's a victor's crown waiting for every one of them. And then there's one other thought, and that is the entering in on the other side, which is far better than just going to heaven if you accomplish what I'm going to mention. Number one, some will shine according to the Bible. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. The more souls you win to God, the more stars you'll have in your crown. That old song is not off at all. Will there be any stars in my crown? The more souls you win to Jesus, the more stars you'll have in your crown, the more you shine for God. Some will receive a well done. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The well done of Jesus. Would you like for Jesus to say well done at the judgment seat of Christ when he looks you in the eyes? Would you? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Would you like for the Lord to say that to you? And then to see your loved ones in heaven. It's far better than just merely going to heaven. Yeah. Walk up and shake hands with mama. Shake hands with daddy. Shake hands with your children, your loved ones, your wife or your husband. Grab them around the neck. Give them a big hug. That's better than just going to heaven. I have a mother and dad waiting on the other side. You have loved ones on the other side. I want to put my arms around them once again and tell them how I missed them and good to see them on heaven's shore. Yes, beloved, to see your loved ones and then to see Jesus. To see Jesus is far better than just merely going to heaven. If you went to heaven and didn't see Jesus, you'd be disappointed. You'll never see him in person down here. But you can't see him in person over there. To see Jesus is far better than just going to heaven. At Georgetown University many years ago, there was a football player on the football team. He didn't get to play very often because he was just an average player. And, but every day he had his dad by the arm. And dad walked down the football field and his dad would sit down. And then occasionally he got to go in and play. One day the phone rang. The coach went to the phone and this mother said, uh, would you tell my son to come home? His father just dropped dead. And the coach went to this boy and told him, said, son, your father just dropped dead. And, and your mother says, come home. He went home. He's gone about three days. And then he came back. And they was to play a real strong team. And he went to the coach. And he said, coach, would you let me play today? And the coach said, well, I'll let you start. And uh, I'll let you play some. He said, I'd certainly appreciate it. The coach sent him out on the field. That young football player, man, he passed that ball, he blocked, he tackled. He just, just about single-handed won the ball game. And he played the full 60 minutes. The coach wouldn't take him out. At the end of the game, the coach said, son, come here a minute. Said, you have never played ball like that before. Said, what happened to you? He said, coach, sir, it's like this. Said, have you seen me coming in holding my daddy's arm? He said, yes. He said, my daddy had never seen me play. He's totally blind. But always come and sit in the grandstand and, and holler and encourage us and ca to carry on. But said, you know, my daddy's up here in heaven today and said, this is a real ball game he ever saw me play. And said, I want to do my best. And he did his best because he felt like his daddy was looking on, seeing him play his first real ball game. God is looking on, beloved. Are you playing your game for God? God is looking on. And God will be expecting at the end of life's journey to beckon you to him and let you know how you come out. Do your best for God. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it to your glory. May your name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. Always say a do. Had your way. May your people be faithful and bless them, our Father, and use them and bless the meeting coming up and speak to the real listed audience. I thank you, our Father, for what you've done and going to do in the lovely, lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Now, while David plays softly on the um, 
instrument. I wonder today, would you come down for salvation, or come down for rededication, or come back to God, or join the church? If God is speaking to you today, you and you alone know whether or not He is. And I want you to obey the Lord. Would you come? While she plays, come right on. get saved you need to come back to God I thank God the last few weeks we've been having people saved join the church and I'm glad about that for a period of time we hit a dry spell it bothered me but God has come and helped us and we on the increase and on the upward drive and I, I, I'm glad about that and God is speaking to you I want you to come come while we wait we're not going to keep another moment or so You and you alone know whether or not you should come. 